Um, I'm uh, uh, Pat Walsh. I am the uh, Human Performance Account Manager for Lidos, predominantly in the growth area. Um, what I like about that is, is we're constantly looking at where the market, where the research and where the strategy is going um, for what we think in this wearable and where research providers, clinicians all meet. Um, it's really interesting uh, a time um, as we start to see the influx of a bunch of different technologies, um, both where Lido sits, um, but from a research perspective from UVA. So we got four um, outstanding uh, experts in this field. Um, Dr. Jack Stankovic, the director of Lincoln Labs, uh, Link Labs, Dr. Laura Barnes, the associate professor of Link Lab, uh, Dr. Amy S uh, Silder, uh, research engineer, um, which we, 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 I know she's out at, in uh, Point Loma, uh, Warfighter Performance Department of the Naval Health Research. Uh, Dr. Meg Garvey, who's an exercise scientist, um, not only supports LIDOS, but also is in the academia as well uh, with the university in Boston. So anyways, we've got four outstanding uh, individuals and I'd like to start off in, in just a brief introduction um, in your interests in the, so brief introduction of who you are. Uh, two, two questions right off the bat. If you have a favorite wearable or device, please mention it, okay? And then also, um, what you think the field will be going to with these use of your favorite device, okay? And I'll let Jack go ahead and kick it off. And it's okay if I just call everybody by their first name. Perfect, yeah. Jack, why don't you go ahead and kick it off and then we'll go to Laura and then we'll follow back with the, the Lido's team. So Jack, Can I ask a quick question first? Are there only yeah, seven please. people on this call or are there others that we can't see or what's going on? Like um, who's attending this? There are a total of 30 attendees, but because it's a webinar, we don't see their faces. Oh, okay, got it. So they're listening and seeing us, but they can't, we can't see them. Correct. Oh, got Great. it, okay, sure. And at the moment, Great question. It lists there's 30 attendees, so it's at least 30 people. Plus recording, and we'll go from right, there. So, 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 so thank you, Patrick. So uh, I'm Jack Sankovic. I'm the director of the Link Lab, and I've been working in smart health for 15 years or so now. Uh, I also work in smart cities, and I think those two need to, to come together. Um, I just want to briefly say that our Link Lab has probably 10 to 12 faculty working in smart health, and you, know, you will hear from two of us today. So there's still a lot of other things going on as well. So, so my own work is I, I like to have a theme around what I'm doing. And my theme is whether or not wearables can create a revolution in smart health. And I think they are on the cusp of doing that. And the way that I look at it is how is, how is that going to happen? I think the the wearables have to become like a cognitive assistants. So they're gonna be interacting with a person in a, in a verbal exchange and producing very you know, kind of significant medical uh, advances and, and help. Um, and in addition, not only is a person gonna be walking around with a cognitive assistant, but then they interact with other ambient intelligence. So if they're going to a hospital or a doctor's office, General AI, ambient intelligence, I think is way downstream, but I think if you focus it in the medical area, I think you can get close to that. So, so as an example, uh, we work with telemedicine and we use smart watches. We use the Apple watch primarily because it has EKG and has other physiological sensors on them. And when a, a patient leaves the uh, hospital stroke patient, they would wear the watch and, and they would be automatically downloaded with various medications that they have to take as well as exercises that they might have to do. And uh, when they go home, then they're reminded for what medications, but they can talk to the watch and say, why am I taking this medication? How many medications? When do I take it? Do I have to take it with, with uh, meals or before meals? So, so the idea is to have a, a much more engaging ex exchange with the person about their medications. And many of the patients have seven to 10 medications that they have to take. So it's not so simple for them to remember all of this. It, same thing with exercise. So we would uh, have reminders for the exercise and then they could ask what, what exercises, how many repetitions, all sorts of questions about that. And we're adding in now the quality of the exercise. So not that, that they're just doing it, but using 
accelerometer on the on the watch can can detect how how they're progressing, for example. And we want to combine that uh, with uh, whatever physiological sensors are there, such as the EKG. Uh, and uh, this is the notion of making the watch more and more comprehensive. So it's not a physical, simple, single thing that it does. And uh, once COVID came around, we could add features to the watch to detect for coughing, detect for temperature, uh, and things like that might indicate they're, they're having uh, problems with potentially with COVID. And then they could ask questions about, uh, well, where can I get the shot? How many people died today in the country or in Virginia or whatever state you're in and so on. So there's this notion of having a collection of concentrated services that could be tailored and changed as well as integrating those services with with context and environments. If you go to a doctor's office or, or I know something like medical records and, and, and trying to integrate that as well. Um, we, you know, I, I think I will stop there just as the, as the introduction. Uh, there are other things that I might bring up as <laughs> responding to various questions later on. No, that was great. And just from you, what I heard is, um, as you work with the iWatch in particular, you seem to be doing a lot of research with the iWatch and that Google platform, tying those things together. Great, thank you. Great, yeah. Bar, over to you. Sorry, uh, I'm Laura Barnes. I'm an associate professor of systems engineering uh, in the Link Lab. And I do not wanna reiterate a lot of what Jack has said, but um, my research leverages smartphones and wearable devices for intervention. Um, and understanding health-related behaviors in a number of populations. We just uh, wrapped up a large program uh, called the DARPA Warfighter Analytics uh, uh, using smartphones for health, where we looked at infectious disease and TBI. We do a lot in anxiety and depression for uh, in the student population and outside of the student population. Um, we've also worked in a lot in cancer and what I'll add is, so the biggest focus of our work, and, and I'm going to lead with what's my favorite wearable, and it is not a one size fits all. If you're asking me personally, I love my Aura Ring for certain things, and I love my Apple Watch for other things. But alone, no single wearable will do it all right now. And that's the biggest thing uh, I'll add to this conversation is that we, we use we use Apple Watches in an exercise study for cancer patients right now. In another study, we're using Fitbits. And, these, and, and if you ask why we're using these different devices in different populations, it's because, you know, not, you know, it's a balance between innovation and what will really work for a particular patient group. You can have the most innovative solution in the world, but if a patient won't use it, it's too hard to use it doesn't work, then, then we can't really make an impact or even integrate um, with clinic, standard clinical care and get clinicians to actually leverage this data. And so that's what I'll add to what Jack said, um, uh, you know, in terms of wearable devices. We're not where we need to be. We don't have all the sensors embedded in one device. We can't ask patients to wear two or three devices. And so I think all these considerations of how do we tailor to the clinical population and actually tailor to how we get these integrated into clinic, standard clinical care is also, also very important. And so I think those are, are conversations that can set the tone for what we need in terms of uh, a wearable devices as well in the future. No, that was great, Lauren. You, you, you said two things I wanna make sure we, we... Uh, go back to one is that in that you know that cognitive behavior in those efforts that you started talking with those populations. I can tell you when I looked at your article um, and started looking at the population of college students and so what we see with the tactical athletes as far as the you know what are some of those indicators as far as intervention. Um, I think. Um, are you talking about the athlete, the traumatic brain injury population, or? Well, no, the uh, the college student one. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. I think it published a few years back, or um, but uh, also your TBI. A lot of great work being done in both those areas. Um, so I'll make sure we'll, we'll go back to those. Um, and I really like that comment also about no single device is really capturing 
um, because of the type of sensors they currently have. And a focus area, I think is what I heard is the integration, um, you know, especially getting into the clinics. And then also I would say into the research community, um, as well as just to the, the end user population. Um, like you mentioned, there's, you have to have a couple devices now just to be able to get, you know, um, be able to do that. So we'll go to Amy next, and then we'll end with Meg. So Amy, over to you. Morning or good afternoon, everyone, most of everyone. Um, my name is Amy. Um, so I work at Naval Health Research Center for Lidos. Um, I've been doing this for about uh, almost two years now. And prior to that, I was working in academia for about eight years. Um, the research I was doing there is very similar to here, just in a different population. Um, it's human performance and human optimization um, in terms of both preventing injury, understanding rehabilitation and getting um, both, you know, civilian athletes, academic civilians, um, university athletes, and now war fighters um, to perform at their optimal level. Whether that be, um, I feel very lucky that I've spanned the, I guess, the spectrum of, of people. I haven't worked with children, um, but high school, junior high, high school athletes, collegiate athletes, um, undergraduate students, and now um, older adults in terms of their ability to walk, prevent falls. Um, I did a bunch of um, knee osteoarthritis research, and um, now war fighters looking at TBI, again, different musculoskeletal injuries, and how do you best, basically, my, the theme of my research ever since grad school was, how do you best make sure that people after an injury, regardless of the injury, go back to their daily lives, again, whatever that happens to be in their optimal fashion. Um, and so how wearables fits into this is actually just starting. Um, so at my former position at the university, um, we did a lot of uh, motion, obviously motion capture research, maybe not obviously, because um, that's the gold standard and the historical still is um, what you use to monitor people's motion. Um, but I, that's limited to a laboratory setting. And so what we tried to do was send people home with um, IMUs, uh, store purchased IMUs, not commercial. So just little chips embedded in their shoes to monitor their motion. We had pedometers sent home with them, surveys, things like that. And um, this is leading into my opinion of wearable sensors and maybe some of the limitations we have. Um, we had actually literally two of them get flushed on the toilet. Um, literally flushed down the toilet. Um, and we've got a lot of people lose them and a lot of people just don't know how to use them. They lose the battery, you name it. You can get every excuse possible. You think excuses are good for homework assignments. They're even better with wearable sensors when you ask people to use them. So that's a huge <laughs> struggle, um, fun, but also a struggle. Um, and so we did a lot of attempting to do that before some of these commercially, you know, wearable commercial devices have just taken off, I swear, in the last 10 years. Um, so I think that's very exciting, um, but it's also, I'm gonna say, I don't have a fair, favorite wearable sensor. Um, and the reason is I think that they're just, uh, they have very specific uses and they have a the ability to misinterpret the information very clearly. So my neighbor across the street, super successful woman, but she's obsessed with getting 10,000 steps a day and she will walk back and forth. Um, smart, <laughs> smart lady. Um, but, you know, and my dad um, does very similar things. The number of times he asks me, and so he's in the seventies, the number of times he asks me about, you know, should I be doing this? I roll my eyes, thankfully over the phone and say no. So I think one of the things that we have to do as researchers and, you know, clinicians as well, um, you know, the spread of, I guess, professionals using and helping people use these wearable devices is what, how do you best inform people and help them, I guess, I don't know if misinformation is the right word, misinterpretation, misuse, how do you get the most out of these devices um, without going crazy? Um, not to say my neighbor's crazy, but you really don't need to pace back and forth along the street to get 10,000 steps. It's healthy, but at what point is it not? Um, and from the DOD perspective, I think there's a ton, we're going to probably discuss this more, a ton of different potential uses. Um, 
but because a lot of times we can't, you know, in the civilian world too, we can't follow patients around. We can't follow the warfighters around into the fields. Sorry, I'm going to follow you guys around for the whole day and monitor your motion, right? So we have to send them out. And I think wearables are amazing ability to do that. Um, and our job is to figure out, again, how do we least interfere with what they're doing in their daily lives and, and still monitor them? How do you keep it secure? And then how do we interpret all that data in an efficient way without spending, you know, a day downloading the data, interpreting it and things like that. So I think wearables are the new thing. Um, I think we're just getting started. And I think there's this, you know, you can have pages of lists of things that we need to keep working on. So. No, thank you so much. And, and one of the things you said about a lot of your focus is after the injury. Um, and getting them back to daily, you know, the, the daily lives. And I think with what some of the work that Jack's been working with the elderly, I think those things, the two of you definitely need to connect afterwards because I think, you know, when you look at smart cities, you're looking at, um, you know, smart installations for the military. There's a lot that we can do. But what I also think is everybody's getting a wearable and there's, you know, you're starting from your baseline is when you first put that thing on. And we don't have a baseline with medical records at all. So we, there is no integration that I'm aware of with baseline information, unless you're a professional athlete or, um, you know, a college athlete that, you know, that's in the SEC, um, you know, you know, maybe the SEC, but, you know, I think, but you know, maybe some of the Olympic committees, et cetera, but um, we'll, we'll hit that a little bit later on. Um, and now we'll go to uh, Meg to round off introductions and, her favorite wearable if she has one. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I am Meg Garvey. I am an exercise scientist. Um, I've been in the fitness um, and wellness realm since I was 17, coaching a um, variety of fitness classes. Um, went to my undergrad. I thought I was going to be a physical therapist and realized while I loved uh, the genre, wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. Um, so I've coached uh, athletes and novice um, throughout my life, um, Olympic level athletes down to, hi, I just walked into the gym and what do I do? Um, and so coming from that aspect, um, spent a lot of years there and really, really missed the hard science. And so um, looking from like an end user of, of how does this patient population or, or this civilian population or tactical athlete population, how do they interact with what they want out of human performance and how can we address that throughout their life cycle um, is something that I've been increasingly um, uh, passionate about. Um, went through and did clinical work um, through exercise, clinical exercise physiology, um, really looking at respiratory and cardiovascular health um, from children um, at Boston, um, Boston Children's Hospital here in their cardiology department up to adults in, um, at Boston Medical Center as well. Um, when I went to do my dissertation work and my PhD work at UMass Boston, I really saw how important devices were becoming um, and really, really wanted to get at, you know, let me look at really big data sets. Let me, you know, try to analyze something from a human performance standpoint and look at relationships between physical activity and um, non-communicable diseases. I focused on bone health, seeing as two patient populations that I had worked with um, throughout my career had been cardiovascular patients as well as um, cancer patients. Um, so, Bone health definitely was a, a, a subsector between those two. Um, since my graduate work, um, because I was geared into devices, I have worked as a consultant for a lot of startups here in the Boston area um, in terms of, you know, okay, you're, you're a startup wearable what do you think that you're measuring? What's the outcome that you want? And then as an end user, how are you interacting with athletes and how are you giving athletes information? Um, what does your device do and how can you make an actionable out of that? That makes sense that would require people to, to use it or would entice people to use it and use it often. Um, 
because of all of that work and um, my academic work here at, at Simmons University, um, I got paired up with the Mass Army National Guard after they won a, an innovation grant. Um, so then really defining on the DOD side for at least um, in, in Army, you know, what defines ready um, for these war fighters? How do you define ready? Um, what types of steps do you need to go through? And, you know, what role does devices play? Do devices play in that role? Um, you know, I think everyone here on this panel has definitely been able to allude to this. There is no perfect device out there. Um, we can pull in or should be able to um, pull in information from different devices and how does that look like and, and how, does, how do we get the most pertinent information out of that um, when we are collecting various, um, various physiolo physiology um, parameters from, from different devices? How do we normalize that? How do we analyze it? And then more importantly, how do we disseminate that information afterwards um, in order to give very succinct actionables to whether it's a patient population or, um, or a warfighter. I myself do always wear my Garmin. <laughs> um, it's always here. I do like the Aura Ring. Um, but um, Laura, I completely agree with you. You have to, just like any other um, methodology in, in research, you have to base what tech you're going to use on you know, who you are using it for and what the applications are. So, so that's Great. me in a nutshell. Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for the introductions and a little bit about what what interests you as well as where your background is. The first question, I'll go ahead and start off. And I'll, what I'd like to do is assign it to two right off the bat so you can start to think about it, you know, you know, versus pick me. So Jack and Amy, I'll first like to start off with you two. And, there, and then obviously after they, I would call in one of them first, and then the others can jump in after uh, Jack and Amy respond. But the first question goes to, you know, are there gonna be any breakthroughs with technology required to make wearables ubiquitous within smart health or for smart health? Well, we obviously know that COVID um, in a lot of the applications with wearables was applied, but what, what is going to be that breakthrough technology? What's missing from the computer science side, from the technology side, um, Jack and then Amy, what's missing from the research side, potentially from those areas? So is there going to be a breakthrough technology in your opinion? Jack, yeah, we'll start with you. Yeah. So I think what's required as a breakthrough, and I think it's coming slowly, is that we need to understand how to give guarantees from the information that's being collected and, and evaluated. So if we're using all of these solutions tend to use machine learning, and the machine learning is uh, you know kind of statistical, and it are we somehow creating models that really reflect the uh, human's health or not. And what we need is uh, the ability to guarantee certain properties of the, say the cognitive assistant that I brought up before. If a cognitive assistant is giving advice to people, then how do we know it's any good advice? And, and uh, the models that we generate typically are done based on data, but the data may not be complete. And so we're, we're looking at ways of trying to combined from a computer science point of view, formal methods that can state the properties you need for your models. And so that the outcome of the models could be uh, somehow guaranteed to, to fall in certain ranges and to, to not produce um, you know, bad results, basically. The, I, I do think the other side of the breakthroughs have to be that the smartwatch will, let's say it's a smartwatch, but a smartwatch would need to be more uh, capable, so much more processing power, and, and maybe some of the uh, computation would be done in the cloud or in the web. But um, the, the need for this multi-sensor modality so that a, a smart, say a smartwatch can cover most of the, uh, the different kinds of needs we have, and people wouldn't need to wear lots of different uh, sensors and, uh, and I really think exploiting the voice aspects of the, of the watch using the microphone and a speaker to, to converse with the person makes the interface much, much better and more interesting. And it's also for elderly, it's much uh, easier. Most elderly people cannot 
type on the watch or you know handle the little icons on the watch and so on. So I think a voice interface is, is crucial as well. Great, thank you. Amy, over to you now. So any breakthrough technologies required to make wearables ubiquitous for smart health? I'm gonna completely agree with Jack and the word I was thinking of is interpretability. Um, how do you make sure the data is correctly interpreted um, and accurate to the person who's looking at it? Um, again, like with the machine learning and you know, eventually most likely AI, um, which is coming in there. Um, how do you make sure that the person is going to get the information correctly? Uh, you know, false positives, false negatives, that quad, the, I don't know the name of it, the false positive, false, false negative um, quad chart thing. Um, you don't want false positives, I think. You know, you don't want a person going into saying, you know, wearing a smartwatch or wearing a device, then running into their doctor's office and saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. That's an extreme. But, um, or I have this disease. I have, you know, you want, you want it to be useful to the people who wear them. Uh, you want it to be helpful. You want it to improve their lives and not create more stress in their lives. Um, so, no, I don't think there's going to be a breakthrough in technology anytime soon. I think we're going to be slowly taking steps towards improving these technologies. I don't think it's going to be um, this huge, gigantic leap forward. Um, and I, I think that's that's where we're headed. Um, but interpretability, correct interpretation, that's really going to help and not confuse people. Um, and not overwhelm the medical system or the... Um, the athletic trainers or the um, just the trainer, the physical trainers at the gyms and things like that too. You just don't want to overwhelm the professionals um, because the, all the users are just got all this data that they don't know what to do with, do with and might not be correct. So small steps forward, absolutely possible. Um, no breakthroughs in my mind are Great. coming. <laughs> Great. Laura or Meg, would you like to add anything to that question? Yeah, I'll just add, I think we need to move away from sort of a one size fits all model and, and, you know, have something in between a personalized model that works well for a cluster of individuals or even the individual themselves versus really these models that are applied like to, to groups and assuming they'll be replicable in another population. I think that's the biggest limitation right now with a lot of this research, small sample sizes. And, you know, I, I'm guilty of it. We all are. Um, that, and that's a problem, you know, having these small sample sizes that don't necessarily apply. So they have to be evaluated on a larger scale to, and, and to actually build models that will work. And I think the field's moving that way towards more personalized models, but you know, we're not there yet. And I think uh, one thing to kind of round out um, is, you know, possibly some of the better quote unquote break breakthroughs that we could do at this moment is our communication um, around, you know, how, how an individual interacts with the data that's being provided. Um, like Amy, you know, noted, you don't want to overload the, don't want to overload the professionals, but then you also don't want, um, individuals saying, well, they're not correct because my smartwatch tells me this. Um, you know, so I, I think being able from a research point of view and a professional point of view, being able to adequately um, communicate how to utilize these and, and where those um, use cases are and what does that mean for the individual um, based on the fact that these algorithms are, you know, general population based. Um, so, so what does that mean? When do you go for, when do you go to your doctor? When, when do you call up your strength coach and, um, you know, how do you, how do you self-mitigate? No, great, great responses. So I'm going to throw out another question. Um, and we're not going to use the word patient. We use, um, this is not a patient, but daily life. So where do you see devices, wearables being utilized, not only in the day-to-day -day of surveying life, in the prevention, intervention, but also the DOD space? Because I know, Laura, you just did something with DARPA and TBI. 
the DOD space from the service members moving through the military life cycle. Let's assume that, you know, cost is not an issue and I'm gonna issue a wearable, um, you know, much like we had a nuke rad, you know, you know, device when we were worried about the cold war about how much rad I would take, you know, because I was sitting too close to a nuclear plant. You know, what device and how would you think that we could use something like that in the day-to-day -day civilian life or in a military life cycle? So, um, Meg, we'll let you start and then we'll go over to Laura next and then others can join in. Um, so in terms of, of being able to integrate devices into everyday life, whether it's on the civilian side or, you know, tactical athlete DOD side, um, you need to be able to, to integrate seamlessly into somebody's lifestyle. Um, so it can't, it can't create more burden um, to be wearing this device. One of the things that I love about Aura Ring is battery life is fantastic. Somebody can just kind of put it on, keep it on and you know wear it for a week in between charges. Um, so it seamlessly works into, um, into their daily life and their routine and their, and their cycle there. Um, so I think in terms of utilizing um, devices in the day to day, um, it, it needs to have that key aspect. And then, you know, cycling back to what we just mentioned in the, in the last, um, in the last question is that not only need, does it need to seamlessly work to gather data in um, their day-to-day -day life, it also then needs to seamlessly be able to interpret that data and send out actionables as well. That means something um, versus just, well, you didn't have a great night's sleep. Okay, try better next time. Uh, um, you know, it's like, well, well, what can I do? And then, you know, should I be getting 10,000 steps? And oh my, there, there can be a lot of, um, not necessarily misinformation, but a lot of misconceptions on how an individual can use the information coming in. Great, thank you. Laura, over to you. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Meg said, but I would add just from my experience working with patient or participants, civilians across the lifespan, <laughs> as well as from different socio-demographic groups, I think we wanna be mindful of fitting in seamlessly into each person's lives, it's going to be very different. You know, we have people that we have very big success using wearables in the athlete sector for sleep, but there is still still a large sector of the population which has no comfort level with them. Um, and I think going towards some of the research and in, in making these wearables more of a cognitive assistant, maybe we, we need to teach people how to integrate them into their daily lives better. And, and so, and adapt. So if we're providing an intervention, can we adapt that intervention uh, as someone learns to integrate this data into their daily lives? Are we providing it in a way that they can make actionable changes. Like, are we, are, is, are the recommendations one safe? Are they, are they actionable, something they can do in real time? Are they, uh, you know, I think about it in terms of, we can provide short-term advice that you can do today, more long-term advice that you can do over, over a longer period of time. Can we make sure that we, we, tar we don't, create more health disparities by trying to integrate them in the same way into daily lives. And, and, I, and I'll echo about just battery life being a big one. Some of what we do is really cool and innovative, but if we have to charge our device every four hours or, <laughs> or even every day for some people is a challenge, you know, thinking about how we get, um, how, we, how we, we balance innovation and practicality is really important too. That's a great point. And just, you know, traveling over the weekend, I just remember, you know, the most critical piece is figuring out where you can keep your phone charged if you do an extended travel. And I can imagine trying to keep, you know, certain devices, you know, you know, and then also the socioeconomic, you bring up a great point as far as acceptability. Um, Jack or Amy, anything to add on that comment before I throw a, a, a different life cycle, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so to me, like you know, using it in daily life is more attuned to just getting access to information, kind of having a 
Alexa on your wrist or something like that, where it is providing information and following up what Laura was saying about advice. I find that this is an area people are not studying very well and it's critical. If we're providing advice, we could be providing conflicting advice that could be dangerous. And for example, uh, if you have a, a smartwatch and it's giving you reminders about well-being and it's suggesting you eat some uh, kale because it's healthy and so on. And then uh, later it reminds you to take your medication and you're on kudamin and it turns out kudamin, you're not supposed to have cruciferous vegetables. So the person has to realize that or so we have to have personalized advice, which when we say take your medication, well, wait a minute, you just had a bunch of kale, so you shouldn't be taking it now. And then the person even has to know that kale is a cruciferous vegetable and so on. So there's lots of issues that come up into uh, general uh, daily life use where conflicts can arise, possibly because there is conflicting medical information even. If you ever go to WebMD and, and, and go to several other websites and try to find out uh, what you should do for a bad back. There's a lot of confusing information, right? And, and maybe Meg knows about that because there's a lot of physical therapy involved. So, and, and this is really, um, I think, what's going to happen once we move away from, say, a, a, a wearable does one thing for you. But it's if it's broader, then we have these conflicts that have to be detected and resolved. Great. And Amy, do you a little bit more on this? Yeah, uh, so I, again, completely agree with what everything's been said so far. And we'd love to know what um, military athletes are going out into the field, what they're doing all day. Why do they come back exhausted? Why are they injured? Why are they, what are they doing all day? Um, besides what they tell us and what their um, officers are telling us. Um, but the other thing I think we need to keep in mind is very much so that a lot of the training facilities here around the country um, and out to sea, there's no internet or very, very poor internet. Like we don't have internet here except for little hotspots. Um, the cell phone reception is bad. We're in the part of San Diego, by the way. Um, if you go north, we're going north to a training facility later this week. Um, there's the, the, our clinicians up there can't really, they have to call in with their phone, like dial in to listen to our meetings because they don't have strong enough internet. Um, and then the also thing, are you allowed to use the, if there is internet, are you allowed to use the internet? Are you allowed to upload data into the cloud? Probably not is the answer. Um, so how do we provide these people and how do we obtain the information? As researchers, sure, we can just download it and analyze it ourselves, not a big deal. But as you know, widespread users who aren't researchers to get that data and use it, um, again, and commercial companies often require the cloud. Um, so those are some things, yeah, you know, there's a million different things I'd love to measure um, on these individuals, but then how do you do it um, by following the rules and also by having actually literally no way of using some of these devices unless they're, you know, data storage on the thing and then you go off site to a city and, and do it there. So, um, yeah. No, great, thank you for that. So is it different when you look at them, and I like the word participant, but when you look at it from a patient perspective, you know, how do we increase the patient engagement using these wearables as well? Slightly different twist, but I, you know, Jack, you've already answered this kind of once saying, you know, you know the Alexa or Siri, you know, on, on you know, the second, you know, providing you, but is, it, is there anything particular about using wearables with a patient for patient engagements that would be able to be used that you want to add in addition to that? How do you increase patient engagements with wearables? Yeah, it's a very, very tough question. And because people change over time, right? They're engaged at first. So a lot of research projects we, we've done where we deployed wearables in, in homes in Los Angeles, actually, for detecting family dynamics uh, over, over meals, as well as with Alzheimer's patients. The, uh, you know, people use the, the, the wearables at first and then they start to get tired of them or they uh, don't feel like some of the advice you're giving is, is actually helpful and so on. So 
the only, to me, the only way to make engagement is that you do need to personalize the, the information and you need to change it and you need to be able to demonstrate that they're still getting utility out of what they're, what they're doing. And uh, you know, if you can combine all of those, I think you can improve patient engagement. But it's still, I mean, it's very personalized. So some people may still not get, become engaged for very long. Great, great, thank you. Amy, anything you wanna to add to that? No, I completely agree. Besides, um, depending on your patient, well, I guess every age level, but 20 something year old military service members and older adults might tend to lose them and misplace them out of on purpose or just because they're just, yeah, they just lose yep. them. Yep, great. Laura or Meg, anything else you want to add to this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll add just another perspective, thinking about if we're talking about patients and a research study or where they're at in their point of care, we actually need to not, to keep them engaged or sustained engagement. We actually need to be one, able to measure that. And we need to know where they are in their care. So thinking about like, are they, are they invested? Are they ready to change their, their behavior? So thinking more about these theoretical models, health behavior theories and where they are in that process and actually targeting the reasons for non-engagement um, rather than just, you know, saying, oh, they're not engaged. It's not enough. But even more so is that these interventions aren't going to be right for everybody and recognizing that. And so thinking about, you know, is tech, a technology enabled intervention, it's not gonna be right. If we're talking about mental health, if we're, we're across the spectrum, we need to be able to identify those patients that this is likely to be a good fit for. If you think about the number of mobile health, e-health and, everything that's out there, what is, what is the right fit is also a very important question. And, you know, maybe dropping out is the right decision. Is it not working? Is it not, um, what is the reason they're not engaged? So that's really, you know, something we try, uh, we try to look at. Great, well, thank and you. Also, when you're translating research back into the real life, it's like, okay, well, how long is your research uh, program? Are you giving people accelerometers for 10 days and that's it? Can you really say that that's their habitual, you know, physical activity level or do they just have a new cool toy to play with um, and they got seven days of activity um, out of those 10 or is this sustainable? Um, and then if you do find something that really fits for an individual well, how can you then carry that from research into, well, here you can continue to use this service um, throughout your, whether it is your medical or your military life cycle, or if it is your healthcare life cycle, um, you know, dealing with a chronic disease, um, you know, for these participants that are in research studies can be kind of like, well, now you're, you're taking away my crutch and what, what do I do now? Um, how do I get this information? So I think it's, you know, being able to, to smudge that line between research and real life. Great. All right, so we have another question. So, and I'm gonna change it up a little bit. So this is gonna to go to Jack and Laura first, and then we'll save the Lidos second. So Lidos is very much involved with this electronic health record, one of the big programs that we run. Um, you know, with MHS Genesis and, and, and within that military space. So, apologize. Um, from, the, from the perspective of researchers, providers, users, and individuals, you know, what is the component of the EHR that is most needed to be integrated with wearables to help inform that data that's needed? What is the most, you know, critical piece of information to be integrated from a wearable perspective. Let's think about it from a patient as well as a participant, you know, maybe a healthy, healthy individual, healthy intent perspective. What is, from your perspective, from a researcher, provider, and individual, what is the component of the EHR most critical to be integrated? Jack, put you on the spot. Okay, so... You know, I think it does depend on, on how the wearable is, is being used, but 
I would say that certainly the medications that the person is under, as well as any you know chronic conditions that they have. And because that would inform lots of decision-making that might go on in the, in the smartwatch. Um, and, and sometimes that information is not even in the, <laughs> in the medical records, mm-hmm. you know, but, but for example, the work we, we were doing with telemedicine, that information necessary for treating the patient at home after a stroke does go into the cloud and then the cloud from that comes back into the watch and the watch interacts with the cloud to to determine you know what exercises and what medications and what doses and then the doctor can change those and so those would be you know uploaded to the cloud and then then the watch automatically gets this new information so you know a lot of the uh, the medical ID bands so you're looking at a, a, a smart ID band that could be used by providers and tracked with them. We're not putting a chip in people, but something with more of a smart I, medical band? Yeah, I mean, but the, but that band could be, you know, as one Anything of the capabilities in a smart watch. And, yep. and even when we, we actually do work with first responders. And if a first responder, say the person is uh, has a stroke or something and they're unconscious, the first responder arrives, uh, could they talk to the watch and the watch would give them the information. Oh, wow. I like that. I like that. Thank you. Laura. You know. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, so I agree. We need bi-directional uh, access EHR data to feed to these mobile health interventions and vice versa. And there are some examples of this, you know, in remote health monitoring companies where you do have that bi-directional, bi-directional data, but it's certainly not easy and, and very costly anytime you think about integrating with the EHR. Um, so I'll talk, since Jack mentioned going to the wearable, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing, like in terms of remote health monitoring and cancer patients on oral chemos. And so one of the, uh, the ways we're trying to look at it first is we need to be able to actually provide objective data around um, side effects patients are experiencing in more real time than than their appointments. And right now, if you think about a drug trial, patients go home and they keep a diary of their side effects. And and so thinking about a way we could feed that, that those objective biomarkers. So going from these biomarkers, we, we collect on devices to the electronic health record where a physician could then make adjustments to a medication and before the patient experiences what like is a grade three or grade four adverse event um, could actually change how drug trials are monitored. So thinking about those sorts of use cases and how the data from the wearable gets fed into the electronic health record. And, and right now, I think if you think about Epic and the Cerners of this world, they don't, they're not really set up for this. So, you know, thinking, you know, working more with those companies, I think is required to, to be able to actually have the, the capability and and thinking about it, what scale does that get integrated? Um, there's another, another reason that physicians are hesitant to, to use wearable data right now. It's another source of information for which they're liable too. So, so these are all considerations anytime we think about integration into standard clinical practice. So there's challenges, not just from implementing and getting these to be uh, mainstream, but also from a liability standpoint, how and in time scale, how's that monitored and on what scale are they required to make changes if it's recognized that a patient is having like these really severe adverse events. So I just think there's, I think we have to work more closely with both the uh, clinicians as well as health IT groups to make sure this gets, and it's often at odds with research because that itself is not research, but it's clinical practice. So again, there's like an a disconnect between like innovation and actually practically getting this integrated into a standard clinical workflows. No, great points, but not only is it, do you have to work with the clinicians, the individuals, the researchers, but it's also these tech companies now, mm-hmm. different levels of sensors, 
And, and, and you bring up a good point, you know, who owns that data, you know, and where's yeah. the data point? And that's a whole another conversation which we could talk yeah. another hour on. But uh, let's go back to, to Amy first and we'll end with Meg on this particular question. Reference the EHR integration within the EHR. You know, what's, you know, what would you say is most critical as we kind of look at this? And, you yeah. know, we can look at the components. Yeah, my comment is very specific to university athletes and uh, active duty military personnel. Um, and the reason is, I'm going to preface the answer first, is because those two populations uh, can get in trouble for not doing their rehabilitation and doing their things at home. So when they're not in the clinic, they need to be doing the rehabilitation. University athlete might not be able to, their coach can say, well, then you're not going to practice. You're not going to compete. You it probably can't take away scholarship. Um, you know, the military personnel get in all sorts of trouble for not doing what they're supposed to do. Their job, if they're injured, is to do their, or sick or whatever, is to do their rehabilitation and to get better. Um, but let's just say, well, the university athlete lives in a dorm room, isn't supervised, you know, whatnot. And a lot of time, the military personnel, not a lot, sometimes they're, they're far from the nearest clinician. They say they're living, training, you know, half an hour, hour's drive from the nearest clinic, branch clinic, where the nearest um, doctor, athletic trainer is. They're not going to be supervised more than, say, once a week if they're out there with their unit. And so, sure, they can come back and be like, yeah, I did all, I did it all, I did everything you said, and they're not getting better, they're not, you know. There's no way to know, one, are they telling the truth? Did they do their exercises? And two, what's the quality of their exercises that they did? So those are the two things. And some of the, you know, I do biomedical engineering, so mechanics, biomechanics, you can monitor the quality of their movement. We're really getting to the stage where we're able to do that. So the quantity and quality of their rehabilitation when they're not in front of the clinician. So whether you send that to the clinician right away or you bring it back to them um, at their next appointment, I think that is huge. Whether they, you know, whether then the clinician uploads the quantified data into their electronic medical records or they just say, yes, they did five days of rehab, whatever they choose to do. I think knowing what the patient did when they're not in the clinic is, is really, and actually having proof of that is, is pretty key. Well, exactly. If you, if you marry up the baselining, the recovery with the, in the EHR with a wearable to be able to fill in those gaps, um, you, you just now, you've created, you know, reduced the number of visits. You've done a lot of other things you can do. Great, great points, especially from that. And I think the same thing might apply from like, Jack, I know Jack's done some work with the elderly population. It might be, it apply as well in that segment as well. So Meg, we'll go over to you for just a shout out on the EHR piece. Yeah, I think it, what Amy said is spot on with the fact that you, you need to understand as a provider um, or as a researcher, if this intervention is working or if it's just due to, to lack of adherence. Um, but then also when we're talking about this, this data and interacting with the EHR, I think another really important thing to bring up is when does this human performance data or you know biomedical data go from just um, you know protected unclassified information and when does that become classified information you know where does HIPAA pull in um, so I think when it's going into uh, your medical record um, and going in and out you know there is some it's, particularly when you're talking DOD, um, when does all of this human performance data about our service members, when does that become more than just unclassified um, information? And when does that do cross the line into this could potentially be a breach of, you know, a, a weak point for, for national security? Can, can one of our, you know, adversaries get a upper hand because they could potentially see this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a, a, another really important thing when we're talking about protection of data, um, of when does this data get pulled into classified 
No, we, we probably should have another webinar on data governance. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly from the individual users so they could use it all the way up to the ecosystem so we can do big analytics on it. But great points, Meg. So we're down to four minutes left. Um, um, this was great. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'll start with Amy, Meg, and we'll end with, end, end with Jack because we started with the whole conversation with Jack at the very beginning. So Amy, in the last minute, um, you know, what is the one thing that you did not get to say, um, reference wearables or your studies that you want to kind of pass on in, as this is recorded? So just kind of closing remarks for the last minute. Um, I'm not sure there's anything I missed saying. Um, we're just really excited to be moving um, our lab and our department, our warfighter performance department at NHRC. I mean, one of, one of my main goals, and I think as a department, one of our goals, um, we have a sleep lab. I'm sitting in the nutritionist's office right now, um, you know, biomechanics, environmental physiology. Um, that's all housed in our building. And I think all encompassing our goal is to try more and more and more to get out of this building, to get out of our facilities and to start measuring data in the field, to understand what's really actually happening um, to these individuals, you know, not in front of some cameras. An environmental thermal chamber is a little different story, but um, still it's an artificial environment, you know, mm -hmm. and like Laura had mentioned, the participants are writing down their stuff on a log, the nutritionist, you know, what are they actually doing? Yep. Um, so nothing in specific, but we're just super excited. And I think we're just, it's been going on for a little while, but we're really just getting started, I think, um, taking yep. off and getting out of here and going to where the, you know, where the service members, where the patients are on a yep. daily basis. So, so that's it. I think it's just super exciting. Great, great points. Meg, over to you. Um, I'm on more of the, the data analysis and, and integration side, um, working on some projects that are helping pull, that are above athlete management systems that are pulling in information. Um, and, you know, how, how can we integrate what is being said by various devices. Um, what does that mean and, and how can that give an overall picture of, of whether it's readiness or, or overall health? Um, so that's a, that's a very um, awesome problem to be addressing, so. Great, thank you, Or. Yeah, I'll just add, I would be interested in, in following up about the work with athletes is it sounds like there would be a connection there. We work um, uh, on, you know, concussion mostly, but, you know, looking at more objective metrics of recovery from concussion that can actually demonstrate which intervention may or may not be more effective for, for athletes. So we're doing a study right now with uh, Aura Rings for, for that. So I'd be interested in following up. But this has been really, really interesting. Thank you. No, great, great. And Jack, over to you. What closing comments as well? Mute. You on mute? So, so one of the things that I didn't bring up much, and we do a lot, a lot of work on, is is mental health, and we look at voice, and also now we're looking both at detecting it from physiological parameters as well. Um, and so I, I think this is incredibly important for PTSD and, and many other situations, and even COVID. It, mental health is is kind of prominent in almost everything. And the other main thing I think that is important is worrying about uncertainty in all these models. And you know, as I get older, every medical condition I have, they, they doctors look at me and they say, "I don't understand. I have no idea." You know, I don't know. So there's a lot of medical, humans are very complex. Medicine's very complex. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that even if we have models, you know, the models aren't necessarily gonna cover what's really going on. Well, I tell you, this, is, uh, this has been a great hour. Um, the last question, I don't think my UVA partners know. Um, my daughter has an early decision packet in. If she gets in, I just need to know, um, but, um, um, you know, hopefully I'll be saying go Cavaliers um, um, here soon. But uh, what a great time we've had for this last hour. Amy, I appreciate you getting up really early, joining us this morning. 
Um, everybody have a great uh, rest of your week. I look forward to following back up. There's a couple areas, both, you know, like, like you said, there's some things we can do. Um, we haven't even touched upon the mental health, mindfulness, um, suicide prevention, so many more things that the group here that we could, we could probably carry on for hours. But uh, look forward to uh, maybe following back up again. And again, thank you for everybody who uh, attended. And actually, we did get some comments. A lot of thank, thank yous are coming through. Um, and again, appreciate all of your expertise and, and for what you do every day um, within the research efforts and your life, uh, life efforts in the, this field. Thanks again. That's all I have. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have Bye. a great thank day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.